In today's show, we look at fantasy basketball. What settings can we do to change the game? We'll find out. Michael Bolton. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it. Indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at basketballmonster.com and you can find me on Twitter as always at redrock underscore b-ball, on TikTok at redrock underscore b-ball and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Thank you for making Locked On Fantasy Basketball your first listen every day. We are free. We are available on all platforms. So we're going to talk fantasy basketball settings. I'm going to talk about things that are problems. We're going to talk about how we can fix it. We're going to talk about my potential solution. All that in today's show. Quickly, some news. Joel Embiid has won the NBA MVP. Apparently had 73 first place votes. Jokic had 15 and Giannis had 12. Now I, if I had a vote, I would have voted for Jokic. I have absolutely zero problem voting for Embiid. I think some of the processes, pun intended, that people went through to vote for Embiid were iffy and shaky at best, but I got no problem with him winning. I probably I got more of a problem with Giannis having 12 first place votes compared to Jokic 15, when I don't think Giannis was really anywhere near those other two guys. But that's beside the point. Well, is it beside the point? It might be it might be the point. But congratulations to Joel Embiid, who's been awesome for many, many seasons. No problem saying that he's a deserved NBA MVP winner. What a great um, career he has had after all of the setbacks early on. And we just hope that he's able to get out there and play in this series and hopefully, yep, get further in the in the playoffs and be healthy. That that would be awesome if we could see that. But that is what has just just as I was um hitting record, we got that news come through. So congratulations to Joel Embiid on being the NBA MVP. So let's talk fantasy basketball. Let's talk league settings. Warney. Let's get it on, Gilly. <laughs> All right, there you go. The voice is back. We're able to laugh a little bit. So what I'm not going to do in today's show is debate what is the perfect fantasy point scoring setting. What is the perfect situation for categories? That's another show for another time. That's not what we're about here. Because, well, not what we're about. It's not what this show is about. Because you know, we're at the end of the fantasy season. Obviously, we're in the playoffs. And people complain about a lot of things in the fantasy playoffs. Now, I asked a question out on Twitter. What are the major issues that you have with fantasy basketball leagues? A large proportion, I won't say half of them, but a large proportion of people are saying, well, you know, it's players sitting and tanking and resting during the playoffs. And while I understand that, I'm just not going to take that as a problem or an excuse because there is an easy solution, an unbelievably easy solution that I have been preaching for at least three years. That... As we detailed on the show two days ago, eliminates this problem outside of maybe 0.5% of issues. Like, that's it. It's done. You finish in week 21. It is the most straightforward thing of all time. So while the complaints can be, well, you know, my players were resting and there was fake injuries and there was tanking and my stars were all out to preserve playoff spots, that is never a problem if you finish week 21. It just isn't. You think you might have copped like one game. You didn't even cop a game missed of Jeremy, uh, Damian Lillard. You might have missed one of Jeremy Grant. You missed a couple of Boyan Bogdanovich. And you might have missed one of Halliburton, maybe. Look, that's it. Like, that didn't happen across the entirety of, you know, if you end at the right time. So that, while it's a problem that many people suggest, that's easily fixed. And it should have been fixed. And I've banged on about fixing this for many, many times. So we can ignore a lot of that, I think. Understanding that the solution is very clearly there. So what are the other issues? Injuries during the season. Well, I'm never going to prevent that. You can't prevent injuries. You can't do it. The way the NBA is played at the moment, the wear and tear on players' bodies, the speed of the game, the you know three-point nature of the game. People say, well, there's no defense. It's not tough anymore. Tough does not mean punching blokes in the head as they go for layups. That's 80s toughness. That's not what physicality is. It's attacking three-point closeouts. It's consistent ball moving, driving, getting to the rim, getting out there, just the speed, the movement the dribbling ability, all that stuff, the athleticism, the jumping, the force, that's all increased. 
as players get bigger, faster, stronger, more skilled, the more ground you have to cover. It's, and it's not about pace. It's not about getting punched when you go for a layup. Injuries don't occur because you get whacked in the head going for a layup. Yes, you might get the occasional concussion, which if they had concussion rules of now that they did back in the 80s, a lot more players would have missed games because of those things. So that's not physicality. Physicality, the injuries occur because of burst, speed, like change of speed, change of direction, start stopping, quick movements, jumping up, jumping down, fake charges, all that stuff. That's where injuries occur. Soft tissue, joints, bones, whatever. Right? That We can't stop that. The other thing that people complained about a lot is, well, load management is a real problem. And I, I am of the opinion that the fact that every dickhead in the world talks about load management, people parrot the term back all the time. Well, load management is killing the league. They just, it just gets cycled back and cycled back and cycled back. And realistically, I actually don't think that many people were load managed this season. The only times really that guys sat games were on back-to-backs for older players or players returning from injury, which I would say that everyone would say, yeah, that's fair enough. That's fair enough. Clay Thompson came off two devastating lower body injuries and he sat the first few back-to-backs of the season. Kawhi Leonard was returning from an ACL. Jamal Murray was returning from an ACL. So they sat back-to-backs. Steph is 35 years old, played through until the end of June last season. He sat a couple of non-back-to-backs. But in general, we, we seem to prescribe this idea that everyone is sitting every single back-to-back and there is random rest days all the time, and it just isn't true. It just isn't as true as you are made to believe. There are definitely players sitting games more so than in the past, but I would argue that it is absolutely nowhere near the level that people um, claim that it is. It just doesn't happen as often as people claim. Are there more caution? Is there more caution with injuries? Yeah. Should there be? Yeah, there should. You shouldn't be forcing players to play through injuries when there is risk of further damaging that or causing that problem. I, I don't think anyway. So I, I, there's no real solution to players getting hurt in season, but I do have a few ideas on that. Waiver access, time zones. I'm not in front of my computer all day, so the bloke who's got no life and watches games, as soon as something happens, he can immediately grab that player. That's a common complaint. It's got to be a full-time job to play fantasy basketball. It's a common complaint. Time constraints, same sort of thing. Like, I don't have time to go and set this stuff every day and be on the lookout for waivers every day and late scratches happening during the NBA to make all these changes. I don't have time for that. Okay. And then the other big one that people complain about is games played inequality. Well, at the start of the week, I've got 40 games. My opponent's got 50. I've lost from the start. How can I compete with that? No point even trying this week. And while that is a little melodramatic, people feel that way and that can be a problem. Now, you can very easily win weeks with fewer games. There is no, you can do that without any problem at all. But I agree that there is a problem associated with that. Now, Fantasy basketball, so many fantasy basketball settings are entrenched in stone for reasons that are not clear. Why do we have Yahoo with default two centers? Well, that's what they've always done. Why? Oh, I don't know. Why does ESPN have a default situation where you can only have a maximum four centers on your roster? The answer is because they always have. Why do we have a default setting of 10 starters and three bench? I don't know. We always have. Why do we have the standard nine categories? Field goal percentage, free throws, turnovers, points, threes, rebounds, assists, steals, blocks. Well, we always have. And those answers aren't good enough. The reason you have them is because they've always been there. It doesn't actually mean jack shit. Now, it is a very big uphill battle to try and change people's opinions on things that have lasted traditionally. You know, you think what fantasy basketball is, these are the things that you think. It is a 10 roster, three bench guys, if you're on Yahoo and you only play Yahoo, if I if anyone dares to suggest you shouldn't have two starting centers, oh, but why not? Why can't you have two starting centers? It's easy to find two starting centers, but why do you have it? We are ingrained as a general community, just general world, to be like, this is what has always happened. Therefore, it must have a reason and it must continue. And I would say, bullshit. You don't have to do that. And the games played in equity, it is a concern. You can battle it, but it is a concern. And part of the thing I'll, I'll say is 
Obviously, fantasy basketball is not as popular as fantasy football, very clearly. And I don't want to turn fantasy basketball into fantasy football, but I also want the sport to grow. And if there are people complaining about these things and they compare and contrast to fantasy football, there are ways to make fantasy basketball more more akin to that fairness level, even though there's tons of luck in fantasy football, we know that, but that fairness level that seems to be attributed to fantasy football in those areas. And there are ways to fix it. It's not going to be for everybody, but I've got some ideas. And we're going to go through that right now. But today's episode is brought to you by eBay Motors. For a championship team, it's all about making sure every player is a perfect fit. It's the same when it comes to your vehicle. Every part needs to fit just right. So the next time you need parts and accessories, head to eBay Motors. With eBay Guaranteed Fit, you can be sure every part you need fits right the first time around. Just add your ride to my garage and look... Do I, did you say garage or garage? Or garage, as some people would say. Look for the green check to know your part will fit or your money back. Just like in sports, confidence is the name of the game when you shop on eBay Motors. And with over 122 million parts to choose from, you'll be back in the game in no time. After all, it's easy to bring home a win when the right parts are guaranteed. Get the right parts, the right fit, the right prices on ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. Broncos country, let's ride. eBay guaranteed fit only available to US customers. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. Okay, so... Well, we're talking about this already. Injuries in playoffs, sitting in playoffs, resting in playoffs. Easy. Don't complain about it anymore when you can end your season in week 21. That's it. It's done. We'll give you the exact dates next season when the NBA schedule is released, but it's done. You, you end it then. There's no complaints. It's just, it's finished, right? It's That's it. Argument over. I don't want to hear anything else about it, but we love getting more fantasy basketball. Um, the other argument people will have, well, fantasy basketball is way too long. It's just too long. Fantasy football goes for 17 weeks. Fantasy basketball should go for 21 weeks. It's not that big of a difference, is it, really? When the NBA season is significantly longer than the NFL season, 21 versus 17, it's not that big a difference. I think, again, perception is part of it. Man, the fantasy season just goes on and on and on. Does it, though? Like, it's four weeks. It's a four-week difference. If you set your league up correctly, it is a four-week difference. So if someone's willing to play through a fantasy football season, it's not that big a difference. It's not that big a difference. Anyway, injuries in season. So how do we fix this? Um, you've got to have, I think you've got to have multiple IL Plus spots. Now, IL Plus is a phenomenon exclusive only to Yahoo. ESPN doesn't have two different types of IL. Fantrax doesn't have two different types of IL. They just have an injured slot where if someone gets hurt, you can put them on it. Seems a simple concept, No. But Yahoo, no. If you've got regular IL, you have to wait until it's been um, uh, seven days that they've been out or they're going to be projected to be out for seven days. And when that timer starts, nobody knows and we'll bend the rules for certain players. And you are left at the mercy of someone setting those designations as to when you can actually open up a roster spot despite someone not being available, which is complete and utter garbage. No leagues. Yahoo, if you're listening, and I'm sure you're not, do not have IL regular in your paid cash leagues, in your default leagues. It is a nonsense setting. You need to get rid of it. Just make everything IL+. Plus. I'm sure whoever running his Yahoo Fantasy Care Twitter account loves being bombarded every single day. Uh, when is this player getting IL+, Plus? it's been three games. When are we doing this? Just fix it. It is, the again, easy fixes that don't get implemented are, are just ridiculous. And I have no sympathy for a commissioner that doesn't do this. I have sympathy for people playing in leagues that don't do this and their commissioner won't listen or they're playing in Yahoo Pro Leagues that don't have the setting. Nonsense, foolish, ridiculous. Um, but yeah, I think you need multiple of them. There are ways you can get around having multiple ones, but I think you want multiple. I don't want a fantasy league again where a situation comes where I don't have an IL and Kevin Durant sprains his MCL. You know, that's a far out situation. We don't really ever expect that to happen. Um and then, because I'm in a, a bind where I've got three other injured guys and Durant's out for eight weeks, that I have to drop him. And you know who's in a position to be able to add him? The team at the top of the standings, further reducing the competitive balance of the league, making the teams at the top way more likely to win the league. Therefore, um, the fairness and competitiveness drops a notch. It's silly. If, you've, if I've got Kevin Durant on my team, I shouldn't have to take him off my roster because he got hurt. I should be able to keep him there at, you know, with, to a degree of out, I'm already hurting from not having him there, let alone having to drop him and have a better team pick him up. There's zero justification or extra level of challenge. It's bullshit. It just makes the top teams better and reduces competitiveness through the rest of the league. Not a setting you want, need to get rid of it. I think we need deeper rosters. 
like I said at the start, why do we just buy the default 10 starters, three bench? Why? Why is that our default? For what reason? Part of the reason of fantasy football's success is football's more popular sport. But in terms of fantasy football, look how big your bench is. I don't even know the exact number of starters or bench a standard league has, whatever. But I know it's not a 10-3 split. I know that much. So why don't we have seven bench spots, eight bench spots? And people will say, oh, but that makes the waiver wire so dry. Not really. It actually doesn't. You still, there will still be at many, many times during the season, players pop off, off the waiver wire who provide impact. Even if you had seven bench slots, I'll tell you who wouldn't have got drafted, Xavier Tillman. you tell you who probably wouldn't have got drafted, Jalen Williams. You know who wouldn't have got drafted? Chris Dunn, because he wasn't in the league. Um, you know, who, look, there are so many examples of guys who really come out of nowhere and step up. And even if the waiver wire is dry, this is also, as people love to complain in fantasy playoffs, well, the team that drafted well didn't get the success. Well, if you draft well with the extra bench, you've got the ability to put that knowledge to the test to hold on to some guys. So... Yeah, part of what we do, if you're playing in a daily head-to-head league and you've got three bench slots, there is no ability to sit on a player at all. You can't stash anybody because you're using every one of those slots all week. There's no, you, you can't have any situation where you go, well, I think this guy is going to break out later. I am trying to hedge my bets here with the handcuff strategy, which doesn't work in a standard roster setting. You can't handcuff anybody. You can't draft Jar Morant and then I'm going to take Tyus Jones in round 11 because... Tyus Jones is going to be the 250th ranked player for eight weeks until Jar gets hurt. And then by then, you've lost matchups because you can't afford that. Like, you, I think there's no reason why we shouldn't have deeper rosters. Okay, I, I just, I, I don't... When there's look at the size of a football, fantasy football roster compared to a fantasy basketball one or a fantasy baseball roster even, there's no reason that it's so shallow. It just, it's, it's silly to me. And the other one is games caps. How does that how does that help injuries in season? Well, it means that when you get into a situation where you are in a, a spot where you are, you know, have two guys injured, and then your opponent has 12 more games than you, well, that problem gets eliminated to a degree because there is a certain maximum that a team can go up to. Now we'll talk about the way that games caps are set up later on, but that is a way that you can limit uh, minima, minimize the injuries in season is having deeper benches, multiple AL slots, and games caps. Those are all ways you can go through and help fix those problems. Today's episode is also brought to you by BetterHelp. BetterHelp, it's therapy. We all know that there are lots of stresses in life. You've got them, your family's got them, your friends have got them. And sometimes you go out of your way to help others and try and get them through things. But that's a burden on you. Not saying we shouldn't do it, but sometimes all that energy we expend to help others leaves little for ourselves. And sometimes we need to be able to focus on ourselves. Therapy can give you the tools to find more balance in your life so you can keep supporting the others without leaving yourself behind because you can't be helpful to anybody if you can't actually cope with the things that you're doing. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Fill out a brief questionnaire, get matched with a licensed therapist, and switch therapist at any time if you need to at no additional charge. That's really important because if you don't have a connection with your therapist, if you're sitting there going, this bloke's a dickhead, like, he doesn't understand what I'm saying at all, you're not going to open up, you're not going to get the help you need. So switch, and BetterHelp allows you to do that at no charge. Find more balance with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash LockedOnNBA today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash LockedOnNBA. Let's talk about waiver access. People go, yeah, look, I'm not in front of my computer all day. How do I jump on ahead of the bloke who's got no family, no kids, who's sitting there, you know, setting an alarm so he gets up at 3 a.m. Eastern time when waivers tick over on Yahoo all day. How do I beat that? All right, that's a real problem. Don't get me started on those, again, those stupid Yahoo, Yahoo default settings where I can't drop someone who's played that day and I can't add anyone until after this time. Nonsense. Stupid, ridiculous. Fab is the answer. Now, people will say, I, I don't like Fab. And let me explain that. What is FAB? Free agent auction budget. Every day, you look at the players on the waiver wire and you put in a bid from $0 up to whatever. And 
the person with the highest bid gets the player. Simple as that. It is an additional layer of strategy. It is there to um, yeah, help even out that playing field. I've written there two times a day. Why is that? One of the drawbacks of Fab is, is that Fab will normally process at like 11 a.m. Eastern. You can set whatever time. What, Yahoo probably doesn't give you that option because you know, they're bad and ESPN probably doesn't give you that option either. Fantrax does. You can set whatever time you want. But the problem with that is, is it leads to a situation or it can lead to a situation where that you make those moves and then later on in the day, 6 p.m. Eastern, an hour before the games or 5 p.m., whatever it is, you find that someone is out, it's a Sunday and it's a late scratch and you need to add a player onto your roster. And because Fab is in action, you can't actually add anyone. Now, there's two. There's ways you can do this where you have one Fab processing every day and then between that time and the game starting, then it's a free-for-all. But that also brings in that same initial problem of, hey, this person's got no life, Al, you know what I mean? Like they've, They're sitting in front of it and they can add players whenever they want, unfair advantage. There is a way, again, not possible on the rigid platforms of Yahoo and ESPN, but on Fantrax it is, and I'm going to test this out. There is a way where you can run Fab twice a day. Run it in the morning and you can run it at like 5 p.m. Eastern. So you make your moves and then if you see if anything happens injury-wise during the day, you can play a second one to see if there are interesting situations or guys that have been ruled out. You can set it for whatever time, but there is a way that you can run fab twice a day. And I think that would end up being ideal. Do you need an acquisition limit? I'm not sure. I think that if you run a league with larger rosters, if you run a league with games limits, if you run a league with fab, I don't think you need an acquisition limit. I don't think you need to be told that again, because that also leads into the problem. Hey, what if I've got lots of injuries and I've burnt my three waiver ads for the week already and I can't replace anybody? That is another disadvantage that you actually don't control. I've got to save my ads for this. So I think if you've got those other things in place, fab, games limits, that you don't need an acquisition limit. What for? If you've got that larger roster and you add a player every day and you've got games cap, you're not bulking up and just getting so many games in for the week and bludgeoning your opponent through volume. You're not. You're doing it because you're trying to make a move. You're trying to plan for the future. Or you know, you've got people hurt and you need to get extra players in. So I think if you are going to put in, and I made a mistake with the, the Locked On Fantasy Bowl this season. I, I had the games the games limit, but also had the acquisition limit. And I probably don't need both. I don't think you need both. If you're going to have a games limit, you don't need the acquisition limit. And I think that a games limit is more important than an acquisition limit. Because an acquisition limit can be probably more restrictive to the people that get hurt as well. So I, I think you don't actually need one. One of the major complaints, again, time constraints. Well, again, fab means you don't have to be active on the wave wire at all times. You know, there are two times a day or one time a day, how you said it, where free agents get processed. So you sit down, you look at your rosters, you make your moves, you're done. That's it. You can go in, you make those moves, you go back later on, you set your roster, you're finished. That's it. That's the, that's the requirement. It's not being active all day to find the right pickup and watching games as they're happening just in case someone gets hurt so I can add their backup immediately. That helps that. Weekly or daily lineups. Now, I really, I understand the appeal of weekly lineups. You set your lineup once a week, but for fantasy basketball, I don't think it works because there are so many changes. There are three to four games a week for teams and you, know, you put someone and you lock them into your lineup. They've got a four game week. They get hurt in game one and then you're screwed in that spot. So I do think that instituting a games limit along with daily changes limits the time that you need to put in. Because if you have got a, a weekly games limit, you actually don't need to go in and adjust your roster every single day. You can plan out a lot of this stuff at the start of the week. Make sure you've got your limits set up. And then when injuries happen, you can just make some quick changes. It doesn't have to be every day I've got to adjust every lineup and get extra guys in to maximize my games played. That takes some of that time away. The waiver access question. Um, oh, we just did that one, didn't we? The games played in equity. Again, that's a big one. It's games limits. It's games limits. And people will have this complaint about games limits is that the games limits that are active on ESPN, the games limits that are active on fan tracks have the problem of people go, what's the loophole? There's such a loophole there that you know, if you have a limit of 38, that if you are at 37, then the next day you can go over 38 as much as you want because the system and the software won't limit you to 38 exactly. It'll just be on the day that you exceed it, every game counts. That has always been the case in every fantasy league. If you're playing Roto with a games cap and you are in a Yahoo default with two centers, 
and there's 82 per slot, you can actually play 165 games because you can get to 80, you can actually get to 81 uh, on one of those. Well, so because it, it counts them together at like 164 total games. Or 160, yeah, 164 total games. So you can get to 163 total games and play two centers the next day and go to 165. Now, that's only one extra game over the course of the season, but you can get two extras in utility as well by doing it that way. But that's always been the case. It's very hard for the software to decide which player we're going to eliminate. Is it the first game that gets played that we cut off for that day? Um, so the, that, that's, that, there is that problem there where you can just load up on Sunday games, but again, that requires you holding on to waiver moves to get the right guys into play Sunday. But I understand that. There is a solution to this, which is not for everybody, but there is a solution to this games played in equity. And it frustrates me that legacy sites, Yahoo and ESPN, do not have this ability. Yahoo doesn't even have a games cap limit at all. Again, they are the most popular fantasy site, but they are lacking in everything. Not as bad as ESPN, but at least ESPN does have a games limit. What there needs to be, and I don't know why this is hard to do, what there needs to be is a games limit per position. If you play on ESPN or on Yahoo, a Roto League, they have it. You can play 82 games per position. Yeah, they have that. That is what they have. But if you play a head-to-head league, they don't have that. Not even an option. Why? That is honestly the easiest fix you will find. Instead of having 40 games played max for the week, have four per position. You can play the point guard four times. You can play your center four times. You can play your three flex spots if you're going with a default roster 12 times. And you can play a maximum of 40 games or whatever number you choose. Three per position slot. We can do this. Sites, ESPN, Yahoo, you do it for Roto already. You set limits per position. This is the most easiest, obvious fix to this problem that these sites don't allow. Now, Fantrax does allow this and I am going to be instituting this next season where you run a situation where every position has a limit for the week. Four games. That means most, on average, teams play 3.4 games per week. So, your players will play, the, you know, if, you get a, if a player's got a five-game week, then you can do some shenanigans and you can put that person as a point guard and then put their fifth game in another position. Whatever. Yeah, that's, that's all easy enough to do. But what this means is you get to use your starters for all of their games during the week. And you get to use a couple of your bench guys. Back to the earlier problem, if you only have two, three bench guys, you're using every single one of their games. So if someone gets hurt, you're already at a loss. You can't make up these numbers. It's so hard to do. But if you have eight bench players, seven bench players, then in a perfect week, five of those guys, you aren't using them. You're being more selective as to when you use them, as to when you put them in. But you don't have the problem of running out of games. So 10 spots, games played limit per position. It will fix things. You, ca- you cannot go over 40 with what I'm, or whatever number you set, three per slot, 30. You can't go over it. You, you can't go over it. You are set at an equal limit. So exactly the problem that people complain about and comparing it to fantasy football, well, I know that it's 10 versus 10 in fantasy football. football. Here you go, 40 versus 40. This is the easiest fix ever. But the sites don't allow it apart from fan tracks, which is where we're going to run Locked on Fantasy Basketball Bowl next season again. And we're going to institute this. Instead of a 38-game limit for the week, which I did this season, but I didn't really think about it as having this other option. To me, this is it. This is the solution. You have a game's limit per position. I would love for ESPN and Yahoo to listen to this and institute this. It's not hard. If you choose Roto, this option is already there. This is the solution. Yeah, combined with the other settings that are already there, you know, you have your acquisition on FAB and your larger rosters and your IL, that is all there. This is the solution. This is how you make it equal. It is a games limit per position. And then it's not about who streams the most. People go, oh, I love streaming. Okay, you know what? But that again goes back into the complaint about time constraints. The person who is most active and has the most time to spare in their hobby, serious thing, whatever they're doing, I play it with mates. I play it with my friends. I'm super competitive and want to be the best in the world. Okay, that, some of that stuff's incompatible in playing in the same league together. They're the person who's out there streaming in every player every single day. People don't want to do that. 
Some people do. That's great. And you get the advantage. But if we're talking about growing the game, growing the hobby, growing the industry, getting out to more people, getting more people involved in it, there's got to be equity, I think, across these games played. Not like, well, you only beat me because you had more players. Well, yeah, it's because I, I grinded and I got the guys in. Well, the guys are going, I don't give a shit enough. I don't care enough about it. I'm playing fantasy basketball. I don't care enough to sit there every day and stream through a million guys so I can get three extra games and beat you that way. And while a lot of people listening to this will be like, yeah, that's what we do. And yeah, we do. I do it too. That's how you go ahead and win under the current settings. But because that's the current settings, we think that's the only way to go about it. But it's not. It really isn't. And this is a change that why you might say, well, that takes away some of my advantage. Well, you know what? Be better at other things. You die. I think that, again, we're looking to grow and increase popularity and get more people in, which I think everyone would agree is a good idea. Having this, which is one of the major complaints people have about, I'm always at a game's disadvantage. If I've got someone injured, I can't compete. There you go. That is how you do it. It is simple, I think. Maybe wrong. Simple. Um, just seeing on this MVP voter ballot, someone didn't have Jokic on their ballot at all. Absolute insanity. Whoever that person is, embarrassing they haven't announced who it is but that is embarrassing which crazy person got a mvp vote no that's it jalen brunson got an mvp vote that's pretty weird not saying he wasn't good but jesus christ sabonis got tons okay mitchell got a lot to not have Jokic on a ballot is absolute insanity anyway all right let's um yeah so okay let's Let's go through what I think rosters should be. I think that you know, we get a lot of this, and it happens a lot in fantasy football. I've been trying to research a lot of fantasy football stuff. Is that And it creeps into fantasy basketball. I used to get annoyed at it. People go, I've got pick uh, 2.4, um, and you know the, the 2.4 pick, so what should I do in this draft? And I'll be go, that doesn't make mean anything to me. 2.4, what does it mean? Are you in a 10, 12, 14, 16 team league? Is, is the 2.4 a good pick? Is it a bad pick in a 30-team league? I don't know. But then I realized that every fantasy football league, basically, is a 12-team league. All their dynasty leagues are 12-team leagues. They just make the rosters huge. I think we should do this. Now, I know if you've got 14 mates, you want to get those extra guys in. But sometimes we go, well, let's get you know, larger leagues because we want to go deeper. And for some reason, it's because we're tied to, hey, we must have 10 starters, 3 bench. Why? If you want to go deeper... Go 12 players, 10 starters, 10 bench. Why not? I think every dynasty league, every draft should be, I think, 12 teams. I think that's just what we need to do. It creates more symmetry. It creates just more... Um, and part of, Again, that's also part of the problem in fantasy basketball is talking about it. There's just so many different things you can talk about. So many different ways. Like, am I talking roto, head-to-head? Um, points league, what's the point scoring setting? Am I talking 12 teams, 16 team? Like, what, what am I talking about? It's too much there. 12 teams. I think we should just always do 12 teams. And if you want to go deeper, make the rosters bigger, which I think you should do anyway to solve some of those other issues. This is what I think you should have. 10 starters and eight bench. All right, eight bench gives you the ability to hold players, to stash players. And I think if you do go to eight bench, the necessity to have multiple IL is probably not there as much. I still like to have one, maybe two, but if you're not going large bench, you probably need three at least. But if you are going large bench, I think you can get away with one or two IL+. Plus. I would do it, I wouldn't be, and part of the reason I wouldn't be as tight on positions is that, again, we are at the mercy of provider sites providing position eligibility. Someone mentioned to me two days ago, three days ago, Jalen Williams, the Bronco, is still not power forward eligibility on ESPN. Doesn't have it, even though we started there 70 games? Like, why? So I can't slot him into the power forward position because someone there decided he shouldn't have it. Why? I don't know. Laziness? Probably. But you know, weird position eligibility? Oh, here's Nikola Jokic, power forward. What? Like, sometimes they go over the top with incorrect positions, but I just want to eliminate the subjective nature of someone either being lazy or wrong on those provider sites from influencing how I build my roster. I think you should have three guards, three forwards, one center. I think you should have one flex. Now, this 
I don't believe this position is available on Yahoo. Again, another L from them, but it is on fan tracks. It's a guard center combination. It can either be a guard or a center. And you can have another one, which is a forward center. And that, I think, gives you the ability. What that means, if you look at that list, you can start, in your starting lineup, you can start four centers. You can start five guards. You can start uh, five forwards. Pretty even split between the positions. Is it maybe a little bit heavy on centers? Possibly. Because considering we start in a regular NBA game, two game, two guards, two forwards, two centers. But you can also, if you want, go three guards. Or you can actually have, sorry, um, yeah, five. You can have five guards starting if you want. And you can have one center. It gives you a lot more flexibility to do it this way. Now, I can I could be swayed on different um, setups with this. and But yes, trying to get an ability to play more centers if you want. You can play up to four. You can play as little as one. But with guards, you have to. You can play as little as three. You can play up to five. With forwards, you can play as little as three, up to five. And given the way the NBA rosters are constructed and the way the game goes, I think that a minimum one center, one four, uh, three forwards, three three guards, and there's going to be crossover between the guards forwards for sure. I think that's pretty fair. I think that's pretty fair. So ten starters, eight bench. That is a setup that I would look at. And again, you have four games played per slot. Now you might look at this and say. Well, Josh, if you've got three guards, if you have a four-game limit, well, the same problem is going to uh, arise because they combine them together, meaning, well, that's 12 guards for the week. And if you get to 11 on Saturday, you can play three guards and get to 14 guards. Mm, on fan tracks, again, where this is the only place we can do this, you don't actually have that problem because you can set positions called guard one, guard two, guard three, and they become their own individual positions. So I can set four games max at guard one, four games max at guard two, four games max at guard three meaning that every one of those spots, and the reason I don't have three flexes is, again, just trying to limit that sort of problem where people try and go over the limit. Three guards, three forwards, guard one, guard two, guard three, guard uh, forward one, forward two, forward three, one center, a guard center, a forward center, a flex. Games limits. Roto, I think you do 82 to 85 per slot. Whatever the number is, it doesn't really matter. I played in one this year with an 84 games limit. Worked pretty fine. I was good with that. 85 is all right. You're never going to get your starters playing 82, so it's rotating through bench guys. Again, expanding the bench out in Roto, I think makes sense as well as it does in head-to-head. -head. No problem. Head-to-head, -head, whether it's categories or points, it doesn't matter. Four games per slot. You could do three. You can do five. Five introduces more streaming and using that bench more, eliminating some of the um, uh, fixes that we had earlier. But I think four is the right number, but if you want to go tighter, go to three, and that makes the bench even more of a stash zone. And even helps. The problem with, with three, though, is if one of your star players you gets hurt, you have less ability to bring other guys in to try and make up the difference. Um, the other one you could do is use averages instead of cumulative stats. If you do use averages, though, you need a minimum games played. It's You don't want to put a guy in and he, in the first game of the week, he has 50 points on 80% shooting. You go, all right, done with that. Not playing him the rest of the week because then his average will be 50 with 100% shooting or 80% shooting. So you've got to have a games played. If you're going to do averages, which yeah, is a... You know, there are problems with that as well because you know, if you have a problem, player who plays five minutes, averages three points and he's locked in for the week with averages, then you run into that problem of like, there's no, there's no way to make up for that later on. So I'm not that big on averages, but if you are going to use averages, which is a possibility, and that can help if you're not going to use games limit, averages, which again, not available on ESPN or Yahoo!, it is on CBS and it is on Fantrax. Averages is a way that you can um, even the playing field. But there are a few other concerns. You have to have some sort of safeguard in there in terms of minimums games, minimum games played. Otherwise, you run into that problem of someone has an outlier, good first game. They don't play on the rest of the week and it's impossible to beat. I know some of you will be watching this or listening to this and going, well, what about sleeper, Josh? What about sleepers format? A, I hate sleepers format because they offer points leagues only. That's it. That's it. Offer something different. Offer me options. And the reason I don't like game pick is because it's not. It's just not how basketball is played. Basketball is not one game a week. Basketball is multiple games a week. And while it does, obviously, even the playing field in terms of games played, it's also people are, oh, which game do I choose? It is luck. Picking the right game is complete luck. And I don't want to have that much luck involved in setting my fantasy lineup. It honestly is just luck. You might guess right occasionally, but it is luck to pick the right game. 
And I don't want that. And you pick someone and lock them in and they get hurt during that game. Well, you're cooked. And people will say, well, there is that other thing they've got where you can you choose it after the fact. And I get all that. But it's still, it's still the sleeper format with points only is bad. But it's still not how basketball is played. They don't play one game per week. You could argue they should play only two games per week. And I'd probably be in favor of that. I think that's probably true. But that's not how it is. And I'd like to have that more cumulative type effect. Schedule. How do we fix it? We end early. We know that. Week 21. The other thing you could do is people go, it's an unbalanced schedule. I don't get to play every team twice. So that's unfair. The teams that stop playing towards the end of the season. You know what you can do? Again, the main sides don't allow this. You can play two matchups per week. That is possible. So that, or whatever it is, three matchups per week. So it, I know sometimes in fantasy football, they'll have that um, situation where like, you know, you're, you scored a thousand points and your opponent scored 1,005, but nobody else in the league scored over 900. You go, I had the second best scoring week, but I happened to go up against the guy who had the best scoring week, but I cop an L, and everyone else gets wins. That's not fair. So some leagues introduce, well, you have a matchup going up against average scoring for the week to account for that, or you have multiple matchups a week so that some of that randomness is nullified. Because if I'm actually having a good week, and I've got two opponents for the week, then maybe I'll get beaten in one, but I should win the other one. It's not that big of a drop-off. And it can equal out your schedule. So you get to play all of the teams multiple times versus, well, you got to play the bottom two teams twice and nobody else did. So you got gifted those extra victories to get you into the playoffs. That's the way to do it. The other thing to do as well is you can consider two weeks per playoff matchup. Sometimes that can be a little bit frustrating because it just, again, limits how long you can play the playoffs. But in terms of trying to even out the problem with games played, which I think the problem solved with the game's limits, or the fact of players resting, some of that stuff can be, or the inequity of stars in schedules, and they've got three games one week, four games the other. Again, that's not usually that huge of a problem. Um, Yeah, that can can alleviate that issue, for sure. Trades. What else should we do? We'll never have league votes. Argue it. Talk to my ass. You're never going to get me to agree on it. Never. You should never have league votes. Oh, but what if someone rips somebody off? Oh, well, not my problem. Not my problem. You had the opportunity to rip them off as well. Or what if it's a league-breaking trade? Not my problem. Like, it shouldn't be your problem either. Because you don't know. You do not know what is going to happen. I don't know what is going to happen. I'd like to know, but I don't. I don't know what is going to happen. So I can't legislate what someone is doing with a trade. Oh man, that is ridiculous. You traded, insert player here. I can't think of a player who it would be. You traded Bol Bol for Jalen Williams. Are you kidding? This is Victor Wembanyama 1.0. He's a top 50 player. Mate, he's the Magic's core. What are you, he's top 50. Jalen Williams, he's not even touching the court, man. He's a rookie. Shea's going to get everything. No way that trade's going through. That's unfair. You don't know what you're doing. Yeah. Is that an extreme example? Maybe. What about the blokes who traded Keegan Murray or Kawhi Leonard and got Keegan Murray back? Oh, that's fair enough. Kawhi, she's not going to play, mate. You've got to get something back for him. You don't know what's going to happen. Now, I knew that one wasn't going to happen. I knew that was stupid. But you don't know. So don't vote on it. It's not your problem. It's where your commissioner comes in. And when I say commissioner approves trades, he doesn't decide whether it's fair or not. He doesn't go, well, that's actually probably not enough value there. Not his problem. What he does is he approves the trades and he looks at it. And if it is, uh, this is Giannis being traded for David Roddy. Then you might go, huh, excuse me, uh, old mate. Why would you think that getting David Roddy back for Giannis is a good idea? What's, what's, what's your thought process? And if someone says, oh, well, you know, I just don't like Giannis and, uh, or, you know, this is, I I think David Roddy is going to break out. People lie. Because that is collusion. That is cheating. That is someone, and often they'll just break down and tell you. I don't know, someone asked for Giannis, and I said, whatever, I don't care about the league anymore. Or they, they said, you know, I could root their sister if I did this. Right? It comes out. Because a lot of times, people don't want to look dumb. So if you come to them and say, what's this trade? Are you, are you dumb? They'll tell you the reason so they don't appear dumb. And that's how you find out that it's cheating. And then you reverse the trade and you give them a warning. You go, do it again, you're out. That's it. The commissioner doesn't decide value. 
Collusion is very easy to see. It's very easy to see. Or sorry, that's not true. It's very easy to find the one that you need to investigate. It's quite easy to do that. Uh, not, not, a, not a hard to do. You don't have to make a call on how people build their team, but you can find when people are cheating. It's very, very easy to do. Inquire about fishy deals. Fab, this show's going way longer than I thought. Fab, I think a $1,000 budget is about right. I think you have $0 minimum bids. I know the standard is 200 but if we're going to do what I think, and that is having unlimited moves because we've got game limits, set it at 1000 It also gives larger ranges for bidding. Hey, like if I've got a $100 budget or a $200 budget, then $1 becomes way more important. If I've got a $1,000 budget, we're talking 0.1% of my budget, not 1% of my budget. Not you know, half, of, it's, it's a big difference. And then the larger you make the number, the bigger the scale is of ways. Like if I bid four versus five dollars, right? There's a difference there of a dollar clearly, but out of out of a um, hundred dollars versus a thousand dollars, it's a big difference. It's it's a big difference. There's no in betweens there because you can't bid a dollar fifty. So I think going higher gives more scope, more strategy, and the ability to get more guys in during the season. Again, I think unlimited moves. Two fab processing times per day, and people worry about waiver churning. You know, well, you're just going to add someone and you know, drop them and then add them again. With fab, that's not really a problem. And with the way that you'd set it up, if you like, some people in other leagues, you can add people, then drop them immediately, and that means that player goes on waivers for two days, so no one can pick them up, and you're just doing it to screw with other managers. With fab, that's just not the case. If you add someone and then drop them. Well, everyone could just bid on them straight away, which if it's two per day, they can bid on them 12 hours later. So you're not, you can't actually provide that, that, um, that issue. And if you're adding someone just to add someone, oh, well, right, that, that's fine. You can move on. I don't think that there's a big churning problem when you have fab. I just don't think that's, that's an issue. Although people do worry about that, obviously. Draft. The fairest way to do a draft is an auction. There's no debate about that. They take the longest, but they are absolutely the fairest and the best way to do it. Absolutely no problem. Should do it that way every single time. But if you're not going to do it and you can do a snake draft, you should always try and do a third round reversal, I think. I believe third round, you, you can might push to fourth round reversal if you want, but I think having third round reversal is good. And what does that mean? That means that the order of round two is the same as the order of round three. Instead of the person who picks first overall, picks first overall in round three. That person goes first in round one, last in round two, last in round three, first in round four. Again, you can change that reversal round to make it round four if you like, but I think there should be some sort of, because pick one is an advantage pretty clearly and it has been forever. So reducing that advantage, I think is important in a draft. Not that if you drafted Jokic this year, you're guaranteed to win your league. Didn't happen. You weren't guaranteed at all. Fantasy playoffs, early end, we talked about that already. Should you have a larger field of people in the fantasy playoffs? I think if we're talking about keeping people engaged all season, having eight teams in the playoff, like people will go the default of six. So I get a first round buy. Why? Again, because that's what's always happened. Why? What is the first round buy important for? Your players don't get a week off to rest up. They don't. They can just still get it hurt during the week. They can have huge games during the bye week. They don't get a week off to rest. It doesn't benefit you in that way. It gives you an extra week of acquisitions to sit and look at your opponent, but that's it. But if you're having six teams in the playoffs, you might as well have eight because it's the same amount of weeks and it keeps people engaged longer. Yes, eight out of 12 teams making the playoffs seems like a lot. It does. It's 75% of the league. But if your aim is to keep people engaged longer, that does it. That gets people into that conversation and gets people to stay there. If you go to four, Teams can be eliminated longer. And part of the idea in the NBA was to get teams more engaged longer in the season to prevent tanking as egregiously as it had been in the past, which I think was successful. They had to play in. More teams getting into the postseason mix. Eight teams over six teams doesn't change your playoff structure. It just means it keeps the season alive longer for more teams. Do you have a prize for the regular season? People will say, well, it's not fair. My team was the best all regular season. And then in the playoffs, I lost because I had a games discrepancy or my star got hurt. And while I sympathize to a degree, 
That shit happens, mate. Like, that's just the season how it goes. Again, we can marginalize some of these problems by A, ending the season early, B, having games limits in place, larger benches, all that stuff. We can try and marginalize this problem. I don't really believe in a head-to-head season that you need to have a prize for finishing first. I, I don't think you need to. You can, if you want to do that, by all means. But you can't introduce it mid-season because it is a different strategy in a category league. If I am playing to finish first in the regular season, it is a different team build than playing to win the playoffs. It is different. And slightly, but it is important. Because if I'm in a head-to-head category league, I actually don't care if I don't finish first. I just want to get in the playoffs with the strongest team that I can. So if you're going to have this, you've got to have it instituted early on. But I I don't really think it's necessary. Because again, there's so much that people come back. It's not fair. I finished first. I deserve to win. That's not really how it works. Yes, it should give you an advantage of being good and then some sort of reward. But again, no one cares who had the NBA's best record. No one cares if the Bruins broke the regular season win record in the NHL. Nobody cares. That's not how American sports are set up. That's not how the real NBA is set up. Nobody cares who finishes top of the regular season. You've been good all season. You theoretically play the worst team in the playoffs. That's your advantage. But I get some people want this. I said that today wasn't going to be about what categories and scoring are perfect. Nothing is perfect. People go, what's the best fantasy point scoring system? doesn't matter. It honestly doesn't matter. Because in the end, in a fantasy points league, every player boils down to a point, to whatever fantasy points they are. And that is through whatever formula you use to do it. Now, I think that it shouldn't be heavily weighted in terms of the high volume stats, because otherwise it just turns into... If you have one point per stat, it just means whoever the highest scorers are are the best fantasy players. And that's not realistic. I think you should have some sort of penalties for misses and efficiency in there. Up weight, defensive stats a little bit as well. But there's nothing perfect. Whatever you choose, you choose. And the players get valued equivalently. And that's their value. It doesn't change. As for categories, there's a larger discussion to be had here. But I will say that three-point is made is absolutely not a necessary category at all. It's a stupid category. Now, do I have the answer to what is the best category? Not really, but it's very hard to change this because this is what everyone knows. That is a stupid category. Why are we counting threes made? That was great when people hit half a three a game. Now everyone's hitting two a game. It's just scoring. It's just points. It is the same thing. It doesn't need to be double counted. Field goal percentage is also a terrible category. It's not an indicator of anybody's overall efficiency in the NBA because three-pointers influence it. Effective field goal percentage would be a much better category. And is free throw percentage really that important of a fantasy category? I think it's more important than field goals or three-pointers made. But do we need it? Could we just use true shooting instead to have twos, threes, and free throws all counted as one? I think uh, rebounds, assists, points, steals, block, fine. Those three-pointers made, field goals, and free throws, I'm not sure that they're necessary. I don't have the answer. We'll go through it at some point later on. And do we really need turnovers? If you're going to have games limits, do you actually need turnovers as a category? I'm very much against turnovers as a category. I don't like them as a category. I'm not sure that they are. People say, well, if you have lots of turnovers in a game, you lose. That's not really the case. If you look through highest and lowest turnovers, you'll see bad teams and good teams at both ends. Um, I don't think turnovers are necessary. And I know if you're playing like if you're playing a roto league, I don't see why you would have nine categories. Uh, turnovers is one of them. It doesn't. You know, part of the reason of turnovers is to help balance schedule issues during the week. Well, if I'm down during the week, then my turnovers can stay there. It's not about volume. But if you have games limits in place, volume is not the issue. Volume is not what we're looking at during the week. If you have games limits there, so I think that. I don't know that they're necessary. But I also, again, this is the scope of this show an hour in. It's not for me to tell you what the best scoring setting is or the best categories are. I just think we need to have honest discussions about what turnovers are necessary. If we do this, and our three-pointers, field goals, and free throws percentages are necessary. I'm not sure they are, especially three-pointers made. And that's it. I would love to know all the things you're angry about that I talked about. What am I wrong on? What did I say incorrectly? What do you disagree with? And before you respond like that, think why you think it's wrong. 
Is it because, well, we've always done it this way? Because that's where a lot of these bad settings come from. Do you know Yahoo didn't have any injured reserve slots at all until about five years ago? Because they just never had them before. They just didn't put in. Well, the NBA doesn't have an IL list, so why should we? Right, that was their reasoning. So just because something has never happened before or has happened this way for 25 years does not make it correct. So criticize my ideas and there are probably plenty of holes in a lot of the things I suggested and pick them out and point them out and we work to get things better. But if your response is, well, this is how it's always been done or it's so dumb to get rid of three pointers made, think about why. Think about why would you want, why is that a necessity to keep? If you went through and had fresh eyes on the NBA at the moment, would you institute these things as the things that we track? That's what I think is important. Follow this podcast, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and on the Odyssey app. And if you're on YouTube, thumb it up. Leave your comments down below. Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.